Well, good evening, everyone. We are looking for the gospel in each book of the Bible. Last week, we looked in the book of Genesis. I would like, uh, as we go through this series, to start with a key verse for each book. And I think that would help us kind of orient where we're going. So the key verse for Genesis that I don't believe I, I pointed out is Genesis 12, verses 2 through 3. I want to read that again just so we can summarize again the last thing I want to leave with about Genesis. In Genesis 12, remember that God is talking to Abraham. And he says in verse 2, I will make you a great nation. And I will bless you and make your name great so that you will be a blessing. I will bless those who bless you and him who dishonors you. I will curse. And in you, all the families of the earth shall be blessed. Why is this a key verse? Notice that God does the initiating. Notice that God is the primary actor through it all. Notice that God is describing his own plan that's going to work it out, itself out all the way into the future. And it ends, it ends with something involving our response, but even that is the work of God. This is the gospel. So if Genesis 12, 2 through 3 summarizes the gospel well for Genesis, what I'm trying to say is that Genesis is telling us that God separates out a people through whom he can bring about redemption for the world. That's Genesis 12, 2 through 3. When we get to Exodus, the story begins looking bleak. Exodus begins by saying, There arose a leader in Egypt who didn't know Joseph. Didn't remember the story. And so his people, God's people, bring trouble. But if you're already looking for the gospel, you know that it's in the darkest moments, it's in the bleakest moments, that God begins to shine forth his light. He called light out of darkness. And so, of course, if the story begins with we're in trouble and we need help, you know it's going to happen. A couple of key, uh, a key passage is uh, Exodus 6, verses uh, 5 through 8. Exodus 6, 5 through 8. I want you to notice again the key points we talked about in Genesis 12 and see if you see them again. Moreover, I have heard the groanings of the people of Israel, whom the Egyptians hold as slaves, and I have remembered my covenant. Say, therefore, to the people of Israel, I am the Lord, and I will bring you out from under the burdens of the Egyptians, and I will deliver you from slavery to them, and I will redeem you with an outstretched arm and with great acts of judgment. I will take you to be my people, and I will be your God, and you shall know that I am the Lord your God who has brought you out from under the burdens of the Egyptians. I will bring you into the land that I swore to give to Abraham, to Isaac, and to Jacob. I will give it to you for a possession. I am the Lord. God at the beginning and God at the end. God is the main subject. God is the object. And it's God's plan and God's will to bring about redemption. And the people he's talking to get to enjoy being the object of his love. This is the key verse. We're going to see this over and over again in the book of Exodus. For example, look in chapter 29 and verse 46. This is the end of the chapter. After talking about the consecration of the priests, he says... And they shall know that I am the Lord their God, who brought them out of the land of Egypt, that I might dwell among them, for I am the Lord their God. They're going to remember that I'm the one that did it, and I did it so that I could be with them. 
And then we're going to see it a third time in chapter 20, if you'll go back, and verse 2. And I want you to notice the context. I was reading a book on Exodus, and the first line began this way. Question. It's almost like a joke. Question. When is the first, not the beginning? Answer, the Ten Commandments. If you're thinking that's not a very funny joke, well, most of mine are not. But the reason why, when is the first, not the beginning? The Ten Commandments. Because the Ten Commandments does not begin with the first commandment. Remember, the commandments are things we're required to do, but God doesn't begin with what we're required to do. God begins with God acting. And in Exodus 20, before he says in verse 3, you shall have no other gods before me, he says, I am the Lord, your God, who brought you out of the land of Egypt, out of the house of slavery. I did the redeeming, and I've called you my people. Now let's talk about the covenant deal that I want to make with you. Isn't this the story? I like to refer to Ephesians so often, but it's just such a great example of this. Six chapters, first three chapters. Look at what God has done to rescue you from sin, out of the slavery of sin. And once you understand that, that he didn't just pull you out of the muck and the mire, he kept pulling and he has seated you in the heavenly places with Christ. Therefore, dearly beloved, here's how we should live in response to his grace. Paul is building off of the same story that we saw in Exodus. So that's the backdrop. The book of Exodus is actually taken from the Greek title of the book. You know that by the time of the New Testament, they were reading the Old Testament in Greek. Exodus is a Greek word, and it means a way out or a road. Exit. The Hebrew word is just names. They usually name these book after the first verse. And the first verse here are the names of Israel. But it's interesting to me that we call it Exodus because the main story in the book is God leading his people out of Egypt. Everything else revolves around that. Did you know that in the book of Luke, the word Exodus appears again? It's not always easy to see it in our English translations, but in Luke's version of the transfiguration, remember the story where Jesus is on the mountain and Moses and Elijah appear on the top of the mountain? Luke's not the only one that mentions this story, but Luke is the only one who says, and they were talking about his exodus. Jesus is talking with Moses about his exodus. That is Jesus' plan, not just to exit the world, but Jesus' plan to bring his people out of the captivity of sin and into the promised land. The story of Exodus is being retold in the transfiguration because this is the gospel. So if Genesis is God separates a people for himself, Exodus is God delivers his people from slavery into his presence. I told you that Ephesians is the first three chapters, what God did, last three chapters, how we can respond to what God did. Exodus, basically the same thing. Chapters 1 through 19, God pulls his people out of their trouble. Exodus 20 through 40, God makes a covenant and calls his people to live like those who have been redeemed. It's not a coincidence to me that the space between the end of Genesis and the beginning of Exodus is 400 years. That's also the same time between the Old Testament and the New Testament. At the time in which God had been doing his thing and the time in which we need God to show up to redeem his people is 400 years. And just like Matthew begins the New Testament with God's people crying out for help. Exodus begins with God's people crying out for help. And I love in Exodus 2, if you want to look and see why God responds, there are two reasons. 
In Exodus 2, it says, God is speaking. He says, I've heard my people cry. And I remember my covenant with their fathers. Two things you should always keep in mind about God. God is absolutely aware of what's going on in the present and responds. He hears his people cry. I love this line in Genesis when Hagar has run out of the house and she's out in the desert with her son, not sure what's going to happen to him. The Bible says, but God heard the boy cry. Here in Exodus, one of the reasons God does all this is because he's aware of your current need. Don't ever forget that. But even greater in my mind than the fact that God knows just what I need right now, no matter what's going on right now, he remembers the deal he made and he won't let up. I made a covenant with Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. It's wonderful to think, because it's true, that God sees you not in your sin but in your Savior. But even when those moments where I'm thinking, boy, I am not worth what Jesus is doing for me. He says, well, you're worth more than you think because I love you and you're my child. But it's even more than you. I made a promise to Abraham that I'm going to bless the whole world. And you're one of them. I keep my covenant. Those are the two reasons in Exodus 2. 400 years have passed. And Exodus begins in a way that's going to be very similar to the way Matthew begins. Stop me if you've heard this one. There is a need going on among the people, and so God picks someone to rescue his people. And that person is born at a time where the ruler is trying to kill all the baby boys. That's Matthew, and that's Exodus. And in Matthew's version, unlike Luke's version, Jesus actually spends some time in Egypt as a baby, as Moses does. They both escape. In Exodus, Moses appears, uh, he, needs, he needs God to call him. And so Moses appears before a burning bush. And the bush speaks out the voice of God. And Moses says, who are you? Give me your name. And he says, I am that I am. In other words, you want to know who I am? I am more than you can imagine, but the focus is me. In Matthew's version, at the baptism of Jesus, when the heavens open, the voice changes from a focus on me to a focus on him. This is my beloved son. And in the transfiguration, this is my beloved son. Hear ye him. God who spoke in the bush has now come to us in person. I also think it's uh, helpful to notice as God picks a deliverer, that the deliverer shows that he's God's deliverer with signs and wonders. We're starting to see what to expect when God sends the deliverer in the New Testament. That of course, he's going to show signs and wonders. That's a sign that you're God's spokesperson. I also love this. I know the 10 plagues stand out in your head. They're, they're fun to teach to kids at VBS. They're easy to remember. But it's also possible to take that as a sign that God is vengeful. God looks for opportunities to hurt. If all you know about God in the Old Testament is the 10 plagues, let me give you some context. Number one, the story begins with God deeply in love with people. Remember that. Second, the plagues increase in severity. Look at them again. God's first step is not to kill or destroy. That's his last step. And it's important to keep this in mind because in the New Testament that says Jesus is the same yesterday, today, and forever, the New Testament says God is not, uh, uh, God is slow to anger. God is not willing that any should perish, but that all will come to repentance. Every plague was meant to say, will this help you see that you need to change your ways? They were meant to turn people, not to hurt them. The problem is when we become people of stone so that we end up being people who will stand in the way of God's will and God's covenant, 
That's when God has to say, I will work over you, but I want to work through you. But they were defiant. And so the plagues get worse. The final plague, death of the firstborn. Of course, we can see imagery here that somehow redemption from evil, redemption from being caught in slavery will cost the death of firstborn. We see that in Jesus, of course. But it's also amazing that those who are God's people can somehow escape the curse or have it done on their behalf. And the way they do it is they're supposed to sacrifice a lamb and then put the blood of the lamb where? On their doorposts. What were most of the doorposts of that day made out of? Wood. I want you to understand that blood on the wood representing that this is where the lamb is representing the people so that you don't have to die, you don't have to suffer because his blood takes it away, is an indicator that one day, when people are staring at the lamb on the cross with blood flowing down the side of the cross, they can see the story that was being told all the way back in Exodus. And then God pulls his people out. And of course, they have to cross some line, some threshold. There has to be some obvious symbol for the people to know I am not in the land of Egypt anymore. So they come to the Red Sea. Now, we all know the story because we saw Charlton Heston do it. But in the movie, they speed it up. In the movie, Heston kind of just does this and the water goes up. That's not what Exodus says. It took all night, according to Exodus. And what was the main uh, uh, thing involved in separating the water? Does anybody know? The wind. Wind is a stand-in word throughout the Bible for God's spirit. And I find it really interesting that the Spirit of God or the wind of God is hovering over the face of the waters in creation. The wind, the strong, rushing, mighty wind in Acts 2, representing the Spirit, has shown up among His people. That here at the Red Sea, the wind blows the waters back. God's people cross through the water, pass through the water, and then the water closes on the evil that was following them forever separating them from the land that had kept them in slavery. Paul picks up on all this language in the New Testament in several places. I can think of a couple. In 1 Corinthians chapter 12, he says, Do you remember that all those who passed through the water with the cloud over them and the water besides them, they were basically enveloped. And what he says is, they were baptized into Moses in the cloud and in the sea. And then he says, all of us have been baptized in one spirit. And there's that same word for wind. In Romans, uh, N.T. Wright points this out, and I think he's so right. Paul retells the Exodus story for New Testament Christians. And what Paul says is, we are all in trouble, Romans 1, 2, and 3. Romans 1, Genesis, uh, Gentiles are in trouble. Romans 2, the moralizers are in trouble. Genesis, uh, I'm sorry, Romans 3, if you think you've been left out of the mix, Romans 3, you're all in trouble. For all have sinned to come short of the glory of God. But Romans 4 and 5, whatever's going to happen has got to be a gift of God. got to be a gift of grace. And then chapter 6, we come to the water. We come to the water. We pass through the water. We're baptized in the water. We come up out of the water. And now we're wondering, what are we supposed to do? And in chapter 8, it says, we have been given God's spirit. And if God be for us, who can be against us? He retells the Exodus story for New Testament people. This is the gospel. Uh, turn to Exodus 19 and verse 3. I still had 12 pages left last week, so I'm hoping to only have seven left this week. Exodus 19. They come to Mount Sinai. <coughs> they come to Mount Sinai, and God wants to be with his people. 
I, I, I really want to, uh, I'll, I'll say this too, sped up, but I want you to think about this point. God, ever since Genesis 3, has been trying to find a way to get back to where he can be with his people all the time. And in Genesis and Exodus 19, he says, get the people ready. I want to come down and be with the people. And if you read through Exodus, over, especially in Exodus 30 and 34, the people, they see God coming down and they say, I don't think so. Moses, you go for us. And there keeps being the separation. And so God has to work through mediators. But his goal was always to be fully present with all of his people. But even in Exodus 19, he begins by saying, here's uh, in verse uh, 3, Moses goes up to God and God calls for him out of the mountain. And he reminds them of all that he's done in verse 5. Therefore, if you will obey my voice and keep my covenant, you shall be my treasured possession among all people. But do you see how he begins in verse 4? You shall say to the house of Jacob and tell the people of Israel, you have seen what I did to the Egyptians, how I bore you on eagles' wings and brought you to myself. Therefore, if you obey my voice and keep my covenant, you will be my treasured possession. It's important to me to notice that the Exodus came before Sinai. He called a people, he rescued a people before he ever gave them a law. Does God expect his people to keep covenant? Yes. Will intentionally breaking the covenant keep you from enjoying the promises of the covenant? Yes. But it's wrong to think that you can only become a child of God, loved by God, if you keep all the rules right. God named his people, and then he gave them rules so they could live up to the calling they've been given. It's a beautiful truth. And I see that in the New Testament as well. There's so many more things we could talk about, but I do want to get to what often pe what people call the boring stuff. Chapters 25 through 31 and chapters 35 through 40 are detailed instructions on the tabernacle. And if you ever try to do daily Bible reading, if Leviticus didn't get you, the end of Exodus does, with all the details about the tabernacle. Where's the gospel in that? Oh, it's there. The tabernacle was a tent of skin inside which God came to dwell to meet with his people. And what was inside that tent of skin? There was an altar. The altar where you were supposed to sacrifice. There was a basin for washing. Washing reminding you that your sins can be forgiven. There was a table of bread to represent the presence of God. There was a lamp stand. And there was an altar of incense. And the altar of incense would burn every day and atonement was offered once a year. Don't we see that in John's gospel, John says, and I'm going uh, to tell you the Greek word here. It says in John 1, 14, and the word became flesh, and most of our Bibles say, and dwelt among us. The Greek word there is skene, where we get the word skin. The word became flesh and pitched his tent among us. God tabernacled among us in the skin of Jesus. And there's where we see the altar. There's where we find the washing of our sins. There's where he, he is the bread of life. There is where he is the light of the world. And it's in him that we have daily and continual atonement for our sins. The details are meant to say it is crucially important. It is crucially important that the place where you receive redemption matches up to my standard. And praise God, Jesus does.